Japanese um, snack subscription service will mail a box to two lucky winners today. Ooh. All right, so real quick, you're gonna raise your hand if you wanna be part of the giveaway and I'm gonna give out tickets. They all say something and they'll let you know what it means to be a winner. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I like free food. <laughs> all right, so real quick, raise your hand if you wanna be part of the giveaway. This is actually how cartoons are made, is through raffle, <laughs> and we give away free food. There's actually no animation. We don't get the free food. It's just food giveaway. <laughs> they never <laughs> should have just come to the Pasadena Convention Center. called My Starlight, which is about cosplaying, anime, clubs, high school, everything that we're basically experiencing here today. So if you guys want to check that out, it's Lauren Stone, L-O-R-Y-N. Make sure my mom made sure that no one could spell it so no one would buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> and so you can find it on Amazon, Kindle, or print. So enough Yay. about me. Thank you. Thank you. The degree's coming in handy. <laughs> Um, before I introduce my panelists, a little bit about the panel today is um, this is going to be a really interactive panel. I want to reiterate that to you guys because I've been to a million and a half panels that are more boring than the worst college lecture. And I loved college. So honestly, like this, we're going to make sure that this is an interactive, exciting, fun panel. I'm, we're going to have lots of time for question and answers for all of our panelists. And we're going to take anecdotes and stories from all of you guys with your various experiences in the animation industry. Alright, so without further ado, I'm going to start with my first panelist. We have voice actor Eric Bauza. Hey guys, thanks for coming out. We have, we have Teen Titans Go! director Dave Stone. Uh, he also, he also voiced a character in the movie, so he's now a voice actor. Hey, just you got a cool 
full last name there. Do you know what? Do you know the panel, the uh, moderator? No, never met her. Never met her. You should meet her sometime. <laughs> Married him. They're married. <laughs> My third panelist. My third panelist is Rick and Morty director Brian Newton. Woo! Is this show too popular, Brian? Too popular. Too popular. Too popular. <laughs> and last but never least, our last panelist is Star vs. the Forces of Evil creator and executive producer Darren Nessie. <laughs> Take you guys who have seen it once or twice. Um, so like I said, the goal here for the next hour that we have is uh, we want to make this interactive. We're going to talk about not only how cartoons are made, but we're going to talk about some of the misconceptions that people who are not in the industry um, may have about what goes on in a studio, and we're going to tell you how you're wrong, more or less. <laughs> so starting from bare bones, when raising your hand, please. What do you guys think it's like inside an animation studio? Who I've actually been inside one. Same. You guys have been in there? <laughs> what, I, how, what did you expect it to be like when you walked in, and how was it wrong? Oh, I just assumed it was going to be happy go luck, and then I went in and I was like, this is stressful. This, you expected, <laughs> you expected yes. like Pee Wee's Playhouse, right? No, like, oh, so, and then I dated myself. Like, okay, I, what's the new Pee Wee's Playhouse? Like, I remember like the Looney Tunes, like, I just want to know like, how the creators, it'll be like super easy, but me doing it, like, this is stressful. How does anyone want to do this? <laughs> I mean, I'm here, but I want to do this. I ask myself that every day. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because the three of us want to need to. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, that's a nice shirt you're wearing. That's right. I expected it to be uh, 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 more like a Disneyland, which it, uh, which it was, because I got to go to the Disney Animation Studio in Florida. They used to have a tour in, um, in uh, Florida. They used to have a Disney Animation tour, and you got to see a... Uh, how Disney anima how they actually how they do Disney animation. Did you expect it to be like the set of Double Dare? That's always my theory, is that when people go into an animation studio, they think it's gonna be like the physical challenge in Double Dare, like the very end with like the nose and the slime. Uh -huh. And I'm gonna start with Brian. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> most, most people pronounce it Lauren, but thank you. Oh, that's <laughs> how, right. What do you think, Brian? people expect to see there and how are they so wrong? I, I think that one uh, guest put it accurately. They expect to experience like Disneyland, like a ride and attractions, like uh, people bouncing off the walls and like soap bubble, like uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. That's what they think an animation studio looks like. included, right? Yeah, yeah, like rubber hose everywhere and like you literally go into a room and you get transformed in, for a minute into a cartoon character, you film your <laughs> performances and then you walk out. <laughs> No, that's not what happened. No, if you want that experience, you have to drop LSD. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Which they used to do more often. Sure, than sure. Let's talk about how cartoons in the 70s were made. I wish we could do that panel. Uh, <laughs> we're not going to go with cell shape. We're not going to go with cell shape. Maybe it's still that way at Disney, I don't know. That's actually a really good segue, though. Dave Stone. What? What do I do? If you're going to mouth off to me, you say it for the microphone. Dave Stone. Yes. Do you think that because we're talking about celluloid, do you think that people seem to think that because there's no brick and mortar paper anymore, people think you guys don't draw? Can you talk a little bit about people thinking that you guys don't actually draw and that it's all an animate button and you're just pulling okay. rings? Uh, yeah, yeah. We love been, that topic. I have a big old computer and has one button that says cartoon. And then just, <laughs> 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 yeah, it is better, funnier cartoon. The faster you push it, the funnier it gets. Uh, no, I mean, you know, like, uh, technology's cool because it lets us do stuff, like, really quick and efficiently and what have you, but there's still tons of, like, creative hands-on work that goes into it, and, uh, you know, a lot of, like, drawing on paper, a lot of ideas get just, maybe they're sketched on paper, but then, you know, you're drawing on a computer, you're still taking a pen to a screen. The closer to your pen. Yeah, still taking a pen to a screen and, uh, you know, executing an actual drawing and stuff, so it's still very hands-on, even if it is all digital. Well, and actually in TV, a lot of it's still hand-drawn animation, too. It's just done um, in another country, generally. <laughs> you, we're we're going to go into that as well. We're going to segue into where things are animated. Some are overseas and some are not. Let me think now. Um, OK, well, then let's move on to Darren. I'm going to pick on you now. <laughs> Hi, Darren. <laughs> Hello. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the process of, all right, so we have an episode of Star on screen, and it's wild, and it's fun, and it's colorful, it's vivacious. How did it get there? What's the first step in getting
in your show from the from the writer saying, hey, I have an idea how to make these things move until you're literally watching it on screen. It was a very long process. <laughs> it's, a very, it's, a, it's a very long process, and I guess it's the very first thing when you have an idea is you're having to go around and pitch it to a bunch of executives at different studios and try to get them to think that it's a good idea, which sounds like maybe you just show up in a room and you go, hey, I got this idea, and they go, cool, let's make it, and it's not really like that at all. It's more like you go into a room and you're like, hey, I got this idea, and they're like, cool, what if you change these eight things? Okay, we're gonna call you back in six months. I mean, if I, you know, I've talked about this a lot, but I started pitching Star when I was in college. I think the first time I pitched it was probably 2007. Yeah. And <laughs> Big fan of 2007. Yes, it's a good year. It's a good year. And, and, you know, I didn't get the okay, go make a show till 2012, so it took a very long time, you know? And then, and then even when starting to make the show, it takes a long time, so... Um, Sorry. No, no, I was just gonna say, I was gonna to elaborate on that. What happened between 2007 and 2012, four years? Was it sitting in their thinking pot where they like, now is not the time? What happened? A little bit of everything. Um, it started at one studio. Um, I pitched it to Cartoon Network. I, they, they were actually super cool. They really liked it. Um, but you know, I got as far as storyboarding. So they're like, cool. We like this. Do a storyboard of it. I did a storyboard. I pitched that. And then ultimately they didn't want to make it for various reasons. So uh, then I brought it to Nickelodeon and I did a two minute short with them. And that was that was interesting. Um, you know, when I was in college, I was making short films at CalArts. So it was kind of like making another short film. I got I did everything except the animation, did all the character designs, and I painted all the backgrounds, and I did all the steps for that short. And then ultimately they uh, didn't want to make it. And they actually, there's all these things with rights too. Like they held on to the rights for a year. So I kind of, just couldn't think about Star for a year. And then when I got it back, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna need to do a web comic or something. I started making all these comics. Um, and then uh, and then I brought it to Disney. And then, yeah, I remember I first pitched it to Disney, it seemed like it went okay. I didn't hear back from them for like six months. <laughs> and I literally got some email. I'm like, oh, hey, we forgot about this. So uh, <laughs> I want you to come back and like pitch it again. So I pitched it again. And then it's almost like a little bit like video game bosses, because you never, you're never pitching to the top boss. You're always pitching to like, some little junior, junior, junior executive over here, and he's kind of like, oh, I like this, and then he's like, okay, pitch to this guy, pitch to this guy, this person, this person, and then eventually you get to the person up top, and then um, generally they're like, oh, this is cool, but do these other things, or I'm not convinced, do another storyboard, do some more writing. And they, Can can't, they cancel your meeting 500 times before you yes. get to level up. Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely, point. yeah, there's, there's, yeah, well, you know, and, and that's actually kind of a crazy, you know, you were saying with the studios, like, they're so, they're so different than what you expect. They're big corporate buildings filled with lots of meetings and, uh, you know. Nice coffee machines, I'll say that's that. That's a nice way I've been in a lot of cartoon studios and nice full coffee. Of meetings. <laughs> you know, and then, there, I mean, the great thing is there are all these amazing artists, and like when you actually make a show, you end up with a crew of like 50 people. Like Star, we've had, I think, most of the time about 54 people in-house making the show. Um, and actually, it's kind of a separate thing, the steps to making a show, right? It's like you're, you're having to write it and then storyboard it, and then you're making an animatic, you're doing all your design work, you're shipping it to, to another country on Star, uh, we're animated in Korea. They get it for three months, an episode, where they're animating it, it comes back, you're doing tons of retakes, and I mean, basically all in all, each episode takes about eight, nine months. And that actually like leads me into my next point. Bowza, don't the voice actors make the whole show? <laughs> yes. If it weren't for the voice actors, none of this would be happening. <laughs> let's, we, let's... we don't actually exist. No. no, didn't you guys I, know I, that I'd say the voice acting is like the easiest part. No, and I, but I want to elaborate and I want to talk a little bit about that for a minute because that is, to me, the biggest fan misconception. And I don't mean this in any disrespectful way. Some people just don't know the process. Why do you think that voice actors get the credit of that you guys create the whole show? I bet you get lots of questions about lore and stuff like that, I, right? The only question I ever get is, are you Eric Bowser? I'm like, yeah. They're like, please move. Tom Kenny, Tom! <laughs> um, and I love Tom. But I don't know. I, I don't know if I've ever gotten that question of like the the, the brunt of it is all voiceover. Because I, I come from animation. I, I, I want to touch on that too. Yeah, I, I started out as a, a production uh, like manager actually at, uh, at uh, the studio that produced Ren and Shippy. <coughs> right. And uh, you know, I did everything from answering phone calls to photocopying to sending faxes. Do you guys know what that is? <laughs> you guys know what a fax machine is? 
And uh, is is Funko a four letter word these days? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah, I was a studio therapist. But um, <laughs> but uh, uh, from there I moved on to like just meeting like a lot of people. And this was like in 1999, 2000 when I first did my internship in Los Angeles. All the people that I ended up making friends with ended up becoming the people that are making shows now, like Gabe Soir, Katie Rice, uh, Matt Danner, um, just tons of people that like work on SpongeBob and a lot of Disney and you know uh, Nickelodeon shows. And then they said, "Well, would you like to contribute uh, a, a part of animation called Scratch Dialogue, which is temporary voices before they hire real voice actors like Tara Strong and Tom Kenny and John DiMaggio and all those guys." So, but I eventually found my way like in, in that arena and I left animation. One of the last jobs that I, that I was working on as a character layout artist, another position that doesn't really exist anymore, was uh, Good Vibes. That was the surfing show that was paired up with the return of Beavis and Butthead on MTV. Josh Gad was on it, Jake Busey. No, no applause for Jake Busey? Yeah, of course. <laughs> That beautiful smile. I, I heard Beavis and Butthead and I checked out for the rest of yeah. 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 <laughs> But yeah, no, I, you know, it, I think it's, it's a big part of it, you know. I get to voice Cloudy on Star. That's like one of my favorite voices. I have to say that because Tara's here. Thank you. She'll kill me if I don't say it. You get to keep your job. Yes. <laughs> Woo, Cloudy! But yeah. Um. Well, and Eric gets do a bajillion voices, and he's one of those people that you can just be like, oh hey, we need somebody to come in today, and we need like like an old man of a voice, and like a little kid, and like some weirdo over here, and some monster, and he can do all well, of You it. think weirdo. It's amazing. You think weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> you know Call me. We have the most fun at, at uh, the star sessions, if you're curious. It's it's so much fun. Me, you, and Kelly Ward, the voice director, yeah, I, hammer out like a couple different characters in under... 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> do you get to do like the Robin Williams and Aladdin thing where they just put a bunch of garbage on a table and they're like, make voices, dude? They just, they pile a bunch of garbage just for me. It's my favorite snack. <laughs> Call them like, do you guys have garbage that I can snack on? No, I don't know what I'm talking about. It's uh, usually called the script. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> writers, right? Oh, yeah. Super Brian, you have writers. Jerks. Man, oh man. Things are getting spicy in room B. As you may notice, though, this actually this is a good um, segue here. Uh, all these people seem very, very comfortable together. None of them really, except for Bowser and the voice work on Darren's show, none of them are currently working on anything. I think a lot of people don't know that these guys jump studios all the time. These guys have literally worked in every studio. Everyone knows each other. And I think another misconception, correct me if I'm wrong, my people, is that I think some people think that all the studios are against each other. Disney doesn't want to know what Nickelodeon's doing. They're in bed together, guys. <laughs> Ever, no, I'm Ooh, I don't know about that. I have, a, I have a little bit of, I have some cartoon pitching experience myself. And the first time I did cartoon pitch, um, one, I, I did a pitch. I got notes, I revised it, and then I told another studio was right about to um, pass on it, and I said, hey, you want to see what Disney made me do to it? And they're like, yeah, we want to see what Disney made you do to it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm just saying that is, that is one of those things I think a lot of people may not realize. Um, so going to then the specific shows that you guys work on, uh, Dave Stone. Yes. It's Teen Titans' fault that Young Justice was canceled, right? Absolutely. Let's yeah. talk about <laughs> We all ganged up and just beat it unmercifully until it's gone. I want to talk about... It was like, we had like a crew battle. Yeah, okay. and like the Titans crew won out in the end. Round one. Yes. <laughs> we were a little young. We were a little victory. But what I do want to actually pick out of you guys' heads is the idea that one show is canceled to make room for a new one. I remember back when Teen Titans Go first came on, a lot of people were like, Young Justice is gone because Teen Titans is coming and this Teen Titans looks all like chippy and weird and crappy and it's not like serious and stoic and crazy like the original Teen Titans and therefore we hate it. But you guys, I talked to you about this, both um, Brian and Dave, no successful show is canceled. Why is a show canceled? I mean, there's lots of different reasons. Sometimes it's like just trend following. I would say like, uh, I'd say like Titans was probably, Go was made because comedy was up. And Young Justice was like, oh, because action was down. And like, that's just following a market trend. It's so boring. And like, I wish it was way more fun. Well, and part of the reason uh, action's down. Most action shows are made to sell toys. That's 
the Young Justice crowd wasn't selling to the, I guess, the 6 to 11 quote unquote boy market. You should have bought more toys. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but like, the people who were watching the show weren't fitting that demo, and that demo wasn't buying the toys, but like, older people were watching the show, older people don't want, play as many like Hasbro toys. So thus, like, no one's watching the show, and it doesn't matter if the show gets critical acclaim. It really doesn't matter. I think like Symbiotic Titan was the same deal. Like <laughs> oh, yeah, everyone, yeah, everyone blamed Problem Beautiful. Solver. Yeah, <laughs> everyone blamed Problem Solvers for the cancellation of Symbiotic Titan. <laughs> problem Solvers. Yeah. I love Problem Solvers. I never. Make sure I watch Problem Solvers. I'm me. I love Problem Solvers. So we got two people. Yeah, thank I you. love garbage. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I just want to clear the air. Breadwinners was canceled so they could hire Pitbull to perform at uh, an office party at Nickelodeon. And that was the show saying, that uh, Eric was on with a nerd, our nerd bot buddy, Robbie Damon. Right? Yeah, Robbie. Yeah, uh, he'll be here, I'll probably be here for Anime Pasadena. Cool. He's our anime dude. Um, Alright, well then, let's talk about... I I remember when the, that tiny little show was, um, that was getting started, the one Rick and Morty, I remember when you were like, oh, I'm gonna direct on this random, tiny, nothing, adult swim show, you should come down to the studio, because nobody, like, we don't do anything, and oh, yeah. this show is nothing. Yeah, and I never made it down, I never made it down, and now I regret that, because you blew up. What's it like to direct on a show that is a phenomenon like that? Oh, God. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. We didn't. That's all McDonald's fault. The whole Szechuan sauce. I'm just saying that. Uh, Rick and Morty and Adult Swim had nothing to do with that promotion. That's all McDonald's. Anyway, uh, yeah. What's interesting when you? I've worked on. I've been working in the industry for 14 years, and I've gone from like kids shows to like uh, the Looney Tunes shows, back to kids shows, to problem solvers and Adult Swim shows. Like Dave and I worked on Mungo Wrestling Alliance. Nobody remembers that shit. Okay. Yeah, sorry. But, but like, so when I started working on Rick and Morty, I knew Justin from before, because he and I did some animation for Community, and, uh, and that's also why I knew Dan Harmon. And I was a fan of Community, his uh, television show as well, so I'm like, okay, Dan Harmon fans, uh, Harmon, Harmon uh, Town fans, they'll like the show. It's a decent, like, family sitcom. I figured three seasons, probably fairly easy, if we don't, like, screw the pooch and, like, blow the budget, which we did constantly. <laughs> so so my, after season one, my hopes of that were dashed of getting more seasons after that. But I'm like, hey, we did a pretty good job. Then like, it blew up, and people would always talk about the Misik episode being their favorite. And then the Intermental Cable episode, I'm definitely dropping my episodes right now, also being one of their favorites. And I was just like, I'm glad you like the show. I didn't expect it to go this far. <laughs> Only because like, you're working on it and you can't see the full vision. And also, you just don't know what's going to hit or not. And like, I've asked, like, we, we work with a lot of uh, Simpsons veterans, from, like, not just season one, two, three, but also like Tracy Ullman's show. Oh, Ever wow, like, like season yeah. zero? Yeah, like Wes Archer. He's been on since the beginning, yeah. And I asked Wes one time, I was like, is this what it was like when The Simpsons blew up? And he said, yes. It's not, you don't know. You're just working the show, and then people like it. And just like, glad you like it. I need, I'm glad I have work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's segue into, since we're still talking about shows that are good and shows that people like and dislike, I'm going to go since, let's see, Eric. Uh, that's you. <laughs> Since you're our veteran, you're, you're working kind of in the deep, in the depth of like a lot of Looney Tunes stuff, and you're kind of this like cartoon classic guy. What is your response when people say that cartoons were better back then and now they're all trash? Every single one of them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, it's not true. I mean, like we're fans of. I think I said that once. <laughs> you ruined the Ninja Turtles. Yeah. <laughs> I, I made the Ninja Turtles better and ruined them at the same time. <laughs> when they announced that uh, the 2012 series was being cancelled and then said, don't worry, we're, we're rebooting it. That's the, the, the one thing that I don't understand is, I remember when reboots were, were made because you missed something, because something went away and it was gone for a couple of years. Now reboots happen like once a week or something, it seems. <laughs> and I get it, you know, it's part of the industry and part of the business. Um, I think at least for qualities, sake as far as like you know the demand uh the amount of time that people had back then like I, I say like back then is in like the 40s and 
30s, 40s, 50s, you know, as far as animation, it's like... When whiskey at your desk was a standard. Yeah, <laughs> wearing a three-piece suit in an in a asbestos-filled warehouse, uh, drinking whiskey for breakfast. You sell you my light on fire. Oh, smoking how indoors. How is this different from now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah desk, yeah. Cargo shorts. <laughs> but, uh, I think the demand, and, you know, there, there, yeah, I think things just didn't... There was no, like, you know, internet or, 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 like, even product placement for that matter. It really wasn't like, we need to make this to sell this amount. But back then it was like, we need to make this because it's awesome. I often think about, like, we look at old stuff to, as reference. Like, what were they looking at when they were making, like, classic cartoons? It's crazy. That's true. That's, really, yeah. that's a really good point. One of the things they looked at was, like, old vaudeville. Is, um, um, they would watch old, like, um, um, old vaudeville and they would uh, trace over that or... Or they would do like live action references. Um, Brian, uh, yeah. you know about Minstrel Act. Yeah, I do, exactly. Brian, uh, he's a Minstrel Act. I've been saying it for years. Anyway, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's correct. Uh, yeah. Only because like, that was the popular form of entertainment. That was literally like pop culture at the time. And cartoons in general draw from pop culture. That's why a lot, of, like, uh, I'll use the uh, She Ra, especially Let's talk recent about controversy. Um, I've been saying this, like, I love the new She Ra designs. Not because like it's the sheer I grew up with, but it's the sheer that kids today want to see. We grew up with it, like those of us who are older. We grew up with like uh, Barbarella, Red Sonia, Conan, Barbarian Tales. That's not what kids like anymore. So you're not going to do a E-Man sheer that looked like that '80s era aesthetic. You're going to do a more modern, more reasonable, re represent what what the trend is, what, as far as like uh, representation goes. So yeah, that's stuff. Dave Stone, I know you have some strong feelings on people proclaiming that cartoons today are bad. But maybe, oh, maybe they just grew out of them? <laughs> yeah, I mean, nostalgia's a bitch, right? Like, that's the thing. Um, it's, it's weird, it's like, perspe your perspective changes over time. You always loved what you grew up with. So like, you know, you get attached to it. I mean, part of it too being like, like you said, Brian, um, is drawing from the moment. So it's instilled with stuff that these people like and care about at that time. So when you get older and then you see new things and you're like, that's weird and scary and I don't understand that now because <laughs> uh, I used to wear uh, an onion on my belt or whatever that Simpsons quote is and I'm messing up. And, 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 and also, that and also it's kind of what Butcher said. It's yeah, like, yeah. we can also set trends like Darren's show is setting a trend. Right. Richard Morty sets a trend. Yeah, it's, it's that weird combination of setting a trend and bringing a new thing to it and kind of mixing it together. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, in the 80s, like, there would... I don't know, like, I, I would, I'll reference 80s animation because I grew up with 80s animation. I'm wearing a Skeletor shirt, we want. want. Uh, but, you know, yeah. I mean, at the time, I don't know, they were going for something completely different. And they had different kinds of restraints. And now you can see um, what was great about it, but also what was kind of crappy and cheap about it. And, uh, you know, the production value of animation now is actually pretty amazing yeah. compared yeah. to a lot of that oh, stuff. Because yeah. that stuff was... It was a it was a, it was an ad for a toy. It, the only good thing about most of those cartoons is, was the theme song. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> the whole theory I, yeah. about how nobody I, remembers shows is the theme song you're remembering. There's I, an article about it. Yeah. I dare you to sit through any one of those cartoons like for 22 minutes. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, Thundercats probably the largest extreme with the best theme song, the worst show. You're gonna see three characters. Yeah, three characters with their mouths yeah. moving at the same time because no one was quality controlling. Yeah, the blocks are crazy, empty, and you know, I mean, honestly, like, like you said, you don't remember us one storyline. I do remember the Gummy Bears theme song. Never saw the show, not even as a kid. Swat cats. Swat cats. Yeah, that's a good one. All right, Transformers. <laughs> the whole nostalgia thing, I think, can can really be. Uh, well, I just want to say this for for everybody because there is a lot of harassment that i think comes for for after people that are working on shows you know why did you mess this up or why did you do this you know we're all just trying to make the best thing that we can we're not controlling oftentimes the, the shows that are getting made you know or like disney they wanted to reboot ducktales so they're going to reboot ducktales the people working on it are going to do the best they can and and you know i think generally there's a lot of artists that are very like everybody's proud of the work everyone's trying to do a good job and it, it's just kind of a bummer when these people freak out on the internet and, and it is a nostalgia thing yeah. and I, think, I think nostalgia is, uh, is killing art a lot oh yeah I mean, it's pretty, I'm gonna go and say that. Like, if people want new things, stop watching Marvel movies. You know what I mean? If you want something new, stop, 
because they're going to make more and more because they're making all this money. You know? That's a good point. Um, briefly, because we have about 10 more minutes, and then we're going to open up to question and answer, and we're going to um, wrap up the giveaway, which we'll wrap up really quick. But um, I want to talk a little bit about, with all, of, all four of you, with these shows that you work on, do any of you have any curiosity or explore or poke around in kind of the fan? Well, do you read any of the fan fiction, Darren? <laughs> <laughs> what did Starco do today? Oh my gosh. You know what? I, I, I try to stay away from that stuff. I will every once in a while go on the Star subreddit just to kind of see if they're freaking no. out about something. <laughs> no. But generally, that's just when we have new episodes airing and I'm kind of curious like how something went over, such as the photo booth episode last season had a lot of drama. Uh, but, but, Oh, well, we have reactions. Reactions. But, but you know, uh, I don't know. You know, we make these things so ahead of time that when they air, so as far of them actually affecting any writing that we're doing, that's far gone. You know what I mean? Like by the time a season three episode is airing, we've already written season four for the most part. You know, so you've already, you've already had season five approved, or you know you're gonna be canceled. <laughs> no. <laughs> and all right, let's see. How about uh, Dave Stone? In the Titans office, I know you guys have a hallway of fan art. Oh yeah. <laughs> can you can you talk about you, you the crew's relationship with that kind of stuff, like how you guys deal with the responses that come in? I think it, I don't know. I mean, honestly, like it's interesting because you'll hear from old fans and the, going back to the nostalgia thing. You know, they'll be all like, "Oh, why isn't it so serious?" Uh, you know, but then again, it's like for every one of those people, there's like ten kids that love it. And they're super into it, and they attach them to themselves to it. And they, you know, they just really get the humor, or at least it's working for them. I don't know what it is, but we try to be funny. I, and try I know to what it is. Them. Yeah, I know. Yeah, because well, like you can see the fan art on the wall. It's like, okay, we've broken some children. But yeah, I'm pretty sure that happened to me too. So mate, we're inspiring them. I don't know. Well, yeah, well, Brian, you work you work on a filthy show. So how how many people get drunk and do uh, <laughs> tell you guys about pickle Rick? Uh, I've had so many people do Rick impressions towards me. Pickerick is the best chef, uh, but <laughs> it, the the thing I find most interesting is I've heard from several like just personal anecdote stories of how like someone come to me and like uh, some adult will come to me, oh yeah, Pick, uh, Rick and Morty, I love that show, and my kids start watching, I start watching too, and I love it. I'm like, wow, it's like literally they're letting adult people are letting their children influence them. They're like popular taste. I'm like, I don't know what the fuck we're doing. I just, I just one funny anecdote. I saw, I got to see, um, we went to the Emmys and I got to see Justin accept the award and like he, liter he literally sounds like, <laughs> he literally sounds like that. Yeah. I was like, wow, that's not a voice. That's just Justin opening his mouth. Yeah, that's why I, sounds like Rick. I just like when, when he gives us notes, like, uh, yeah, I, I kind of, yeah, I kind of want the, the, the thing to look this way, it comes out this way. It's like, all right. And the burp time exaggerator, right? That's what he sounds like. You know? And Nancy Harmon's like, oh, oh well, you know, if we tell stories this way, uh, it's kind of like a convey. It's like, okay, there's Rick and Morty right there. <laughs> that is awesome. All right. So before we wrap up to um, question and answers, Eric, what are you working on right now, and where can our people find you? Uh, well, uh, you can find me right here in the Pasadena Convention Hall. <laughs> this is a real person sitting right here. Uh, what am I working on? Uh, Star Versus, every now and then, yes. I did one voice, two voices, maybe three in the Teen Titans Go movie. I was Daffy Duck at the very beginning, if you guys watched that. Yeah. <laughs> and I was Aquaman for that one line. And I was also Stan Lee's assistant. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is on now. I'm Master Splinter on that. Yes. Bless you, my son. <laughs> you got the crackers all over me. <laughs> uh, and I don't know, there's a couple other ones. Uh, uh, Dave? Oh, do I, do I say the thing now? Yeah. Like me? Where can we find you, Dave? Uh, you know, I'm just around. Um, I'll, be, I'll be mulling around, you know, if you're near this guy downstairs or this guy. We have a table ready. Right 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 Eric and Brian both have tables where you guys can go talk to them. Yeah. And, yeah, go see what they're up to, spend some extra time chatting with those cool dudes. Yeah. Sometimes I'm on the internet, you can follow me at, uh, at it's Dave Stone. Can maybe. you do the yeah. challenger voice for us? Some kind of... Uh, it's the Titans uh, It actually hurts quite a bit to do that voice. Do it! Do it! Do it! I'm usually hung over when I do this. <laughs> Takes a couple shots of prep. Let me see if I can do it without being high and wildly embarrassed. 
I can hardly wait for the motion picture to begin. It's, uh, it's, it takes a lot. It's deep in my heart. I took that out of you a long time ago. Yeah, yeah this is what's left as a challenger, a sad old man in a dark void. Brian, where can we find you? Uh, I'm do a lot of things. Uh, I will be downstairs at booth 78. Uh, you'll have to look for the ASS podcast booth. That stands for Animation Success Stories Podcast. Check us out. Uh, we interview writers, voice actors, uh, directors, artists who work in the industry and find out how they got in the industry, trials and tribulations, their interests, all that stuff. We have an episode with this gentleman, Eric Bowser, here, and I hope to get an episode with Darren at one point. That, that's a plug. Thank that you. Be she, she's pressured. <laughs> she's not going to say no. Yeah. yeah, now she can't say no. Uh, but also, you can check me out on Dark King Zorro, all one word on Twitter, if you want to hear me. Rick and Morty, of course. But if you want to hear me rant about politics, yeah, do that. Uh, <laughs> He's very impassioned about politics. Passion means mad. You also are on the you're also on the One Piece podcast, aren't you? Yes, thank yes. you. Uh, I'm on the One Piece podcast because One Piece is the best show ever. Right. Yeah. And definitely <laughs> so check check that show out if you like One Piece. Yeah. And Dara, where can we find you? Uh, I'm on Instagram and Twitter and Tumblr and all the things at Darren Nepsey, however they work, whatever the thing the algorithm is, which is my name. Uh, and uh, and it's working on Star. Still working on stars. My whole life. <laughs> Did you guys learn anything today? Yeah. Did you guys have a good time at our panel? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for coming. Guys. All right. So what we're gonna do now is whoever had a giveaway ticket, hold on to your ticket. And there are two of them that says Nerdbot in red. If you have a red ticket. You're a winner. A winner is you. And don't get pink and red mixed up. It's red. Like my shirt, like, like the, like the bot. So, the beef has one. All right, the beef. So at the end of the panel, if you have a red, nerd, if you, it says nerd bot in red, come up to me. I'll take down your name and your address. I'll send it over to Snafu, and they will send you your own subscription box, OK? All right, so let's try to do this. If you have a question for any of our panelists, does this work? Yeah. We're going to do a line. We're going to form a line, and you guys are going to be able to ask your questions one at a time. Hello. How are you, sir? Am I jumping the gun? We have 20 minutes for questions. Yeah. <laughs> i got to get real close. Yeah. Hello, and thank you for doing this, guys. I worked at Disney for nine years, so I, I know, uh, like when you say, everybody wants to produce me old. Like give give the new ones a chance because they are pretty darn hilarious. My my kids are watching like Teen Titans and stuff. I'm like, oh my god, that's so funny. Okay, the question is like, could you maybe briefly talk about how you have to record dialogue first and then give it to the artist and time it out? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, honestly, uh, let's see. Scripts. Yeah, yeah, I'd say scripts, scripts and boards are, are created. Uh, as a voiceover artist, we get the scripts in email, and sometimes, if they're kind to us, they'll give the storyboards so we can see what kind of actions are happening. Uh, other times, if we're brought in, like uh, for me, I, if I come in on Star, some of the animation is done already with scratch dialogue, yeah. and then I'm asked to kind of like replace it. Um, yeah, there's kind of in animation, there's sort of two ways to, to go about it, which is you're a script-driven show or you're a board-driven show. And scripted shows, you know, it's a little bit more straightforward. A script is written, the script is recorded. Um, there's still oftentimes changes, you know, done by board artists and stuff, but it's a little more straightforward, script-written, script-boarded. In a board-driven show, it's like super complicated and crazy because uh, you write an outline, the storyboard artists um, uh, do, do a pass, they, they write it. Uh, and then we make a script out of that, and usually that script is a disastrous mess because it's like done by a production secretary or something who is like, you know, t just listening to the thing and writing stuff wrong, and it's, it's not, paid enough, not paid enough to yeah. do that, and they won't give us a writer's assistant because they're cheap at Disney. Uh, but anyway, wow. Bitch, what do you know? We're the Sunday overseas, right? <laughs> Nine months so, later, a cartoon is made. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so then, uh, so then, uh, you know, then, then, then you record stuff, and but you're making changes, so then you're animating scratch, and then oftentimes our actors have to come back a second time to re-record the pickups. So. Yes, sir. 
Uh, what do you think the difference between anime and um, cartoons are? And also, have any of you, have any of you met your foreign counterparts uh, who does the foreign dub? Like, oh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I don't do like a ton of anime, but I've definitely uh, gotten in contact with a guy that uh, was doing like like uh, uh, Switzerland Badoos on the Switzerland version of Bread Winners. <laughs> I was like, no way! You do my voice, but in a different language? Cool! I love the German version of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that's aggressive. The German oh, yeah. version of anything is always fun. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> on his initial point about the difference between you know, anime and cartoon, none. It's, all, it's just process and who's doing it. That's the only difference. Yeah. Honestly, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I uh, on Titans, I employ anime style tricks constantly in the way that uh, our action is boarded, and it might not look like anime because of the level of detail or whatever, but honestly, it's the same concepts and like layout and approach and uh, simplicity. So, yeah, yeah, anime without cartoons. Exactly, yeah, everybody yeah. animated is animated. It's, it's all yeah. animation. <laughs> <laughs> nice shirt, but. Thank you. Yeah. How are you doing, sir? Not bad. You can buy this at Toyzilla downstairs. So. Woo! Oh, oh, that's nice. Nice. Thanks oh, for it's me. a good one. <laughs> uh, since hey, we're talking about misconceptions in animation, I think I think the one job that might be like the most misconceptions and most different uh, is is animation uh, directing because I think uh, that's totally different than in live action. So can you talk a bit about that. Yeah, yeah man. That's a, well. It's funny. It's like a kind of a, a, a almost like a loaded title. Because it's like, well, animation director, do you mean the director of animation, or do you mean the director of the cartoon? And it's like, well, what is that? I don't know. It depends on the show we're working on. It's crazy. Yeah. I'm a director on Teen Titans. I've got to deal with animation, but we have an animation director. But I deal with storyboards, scripts, you know, all that kind of stuff, but then also with the actual animation, with the sound design, with the editing, all that stuff. Um, so it's pretty much front to back. But a lot of shows, it's like the storyboard director, and then that's really just the guy who oversees the board in conjunction with the writers and the producers and and it's a little more segmented so like it kind of varies wildly a little more than you might expect yeah. from production to production in my experience and in comparison to live action like a live action director sits on the set and kind of goes go and let the actors do whatever they need to do kind of sets up the blocking and like you'll probably sit down with the editor to form it out but in animation uh, especially as a director, we are our own editors. We have editors, but we are our own editors, and when there are no actors, actresses to go off of. We are also the performers. We come up with like how they do the pose. Like any pose you see, a board artist or a director of that episode had to come up with that pose, had to come up with that expression. So we literally have to act out what you see, because there are no actors. I mean, voice actors, obviously. But and then yeah. nine months later, a baby is made. I'm just going to keep saying that. It's that it always takes it, nine months. It does take nine months for a car to be made. Exactly. Right. As someone from live production, I'm curious about the logistics. What goes into those nine months? What's all happening at the same time? Or what's the order of things that happen? Yeah, so everything happens at the same time. So, yeah. so it's that's what, what it, so it's so, okay. So nine months. It sounds like oh man, making a car, one one eleven or I guess one, yeah one uh, twenty two minute cartoon in nine months. That sounds like super easy. Except that every week you're starting a new one. So every so so your schedule looks like this. We call it the, the rainbow chart. It's this crazy chart. It's a staircase. It's a staircase of crazy. Oh, no. Where you know <laughs> Joy. every week you're starting a new episode and everyone is going through that nine months process and then when you're doing multiple seasons you're just sticking another one on there so it's like, like, like Tetris like Tetris so <laughs> like so Tetris made a glass so it's like the second you're done with you know you, you're done with the writing on your on your first season and you're starting the writing on your second season so it's all going all at the same time which is why you need that crew of 54 people that are doing all these different jobs so like on star uh, you know we were outline you know board driven so we had outlines so we only had about gosh, two to three writers at any given time, but we had 12 storyboard artists because our storyboard artists were doing the writing. So they were working uh, in teams of two, six teams on six week rotations. So then when you know the first team's done, goes to the next team. Um, and then as a showrunner, um, it's, it, that's kind of another directing job. It's like I am uh, doing handouts, talking about what the episode should be, what the outline should be. Um, I am doing check-ins with the board artists. I did three check-ins on every episode. They would do like 
of like a, a, a beat board pitch, just rough drawings of the story. And, and as like, because most animated shows have multiple directors working on the show for television, so as a director, I'd have to check in with the creator to make sure the vision of the creator is being carried out. Yeah, yeah, and the director is then working, like, like as the showrunner, I'm working most directly with my directors, and the directors are working most directly with their board artists, you know? So, uh, you know, Spin and Star, for the teams, we have three directors, uh, so each director had two teams. Um, and then the art team, then it goes to our art team, that's a whole other thing, and there's an art director, and, and he's kind of, he's in charge of them, but then I'm checking in on all that stuff. And then I'm working with editors, and the directors are working with editors. Um, it's a big, it's a But big when's lunchtime? <laughs> and then the segue us into the next question, guys. Yeah. I, know, I know that um, there's a lot of sets when you pitch an idea for um, future episodes. I'm asking you guys, how hard it was to pitch um, even a little bit of LGBTQA representation into your shows? Hard. It's been hard. I, I will totally admit to that because I've had um, I've very much pushed on my show, and um, there are some things that I've been able to do in the show which has been really cool and kind of surprising when they come up. That kiss, right? Yeah, that yeah. was a big deal. That was amazing. That was a big deal. But that you know, but then I've gotten a bunch of pushback from that. Like that happened, and then people at the company were ups like some people were very supportive of the company, some people were upset by it. You know, it's funny because like. Uh, Probably because it's like, oh, it's a show for kids and we don't want to sexualize anything. But it's like, that's a ex lived experience a child might have. Uh, but it's like, they always say, oh, we don't want to make it political. If you have straight couples, that's still political. I was going to say, like, there's a romance. It, yeah. made, it made me crazy because on Star, we're a show with teenagers that deals a lot with relationships. Like, and then they're going, well, we don't want, you know, uh, we don't want these, these, this same sex stuff. It's like, well, you can tell me we don't want any relationships, you're a little kid show. I feel like it's not fair to be like, you can do relationships, but only super straight right. hetero relationships. Yeah. Like, yeah. that's that's not the world that we live in. So we, I've been trying, we've been trying. Um, I'm very excited in the fourth season. It seems like nobody is stopping something I'm excited about, so look out for that. Hello. Hi, train. Next question. So for um, the characters, like, where do you get the ideas to like, you know, put the voice or match the right voice to a character or things like that? Like, is there like a group that just, you know? I think it's just a collaborative effort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's super different every time. Kind of, it's interesting because sometimes it's the character comes first, the design comes first, and then it's like, well, what's this guy gonna sound like? You know, like, what do you think he sounds like? What kind of person is he or she? You know, like, what are they? Like, what are they all about? You know, what makes sense? What's funniest? What's the, you know, most fitting? Um, sometimes it's the other way, where you have a voice, and you're like, well, what's that? How, how do we embody that voice? You know, and it depends on what the effect you want is. Like, are you looking for something that's funny? Are you looking for something that's like, you know, more like rounded? I don't, I don't, you know, it's uh, it's hard to say, but it's kind of all over the place. Yeah. Uh, real quick, on Rick and Morty, uh, Justin has like a, a celebrity pool list. It's just like, I want to get this person. For example, uh, everyone, if you remember the show me what you got, like giant head <laughs> aliens. If you take the tone of the voice and you even take how they look, originally they wanted Patrick Stewart to do that voice. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't get it, but that's at least the direction they wanted. So. Well, and sometimes, too, you know, like you guys as directors, you're doing scratch in your episodes, and sometimes that'll be so funny that, yeah. that, that you'll get to do that voice sometimes. Yeah. That's how I ended up doing Star Fan 13! It's just a crazy voice, but it just sounds kind of funny. The next question? Hello. Um, I mean, there's uh, there's an autism group that has been trying to get me to, to uh, guess teach uh, children with autism that have an interest in voiceover. Uh, and I'm trying to reach reach back to them to find like a, a, a right time to do it because I would love to work with uh, just about anybody that has an interest in voiceover. Because uh, I feel like everyone has uh, a, a shot and a chance. I didn't do it the, r the right way. Uh, there, I don't think there is a right way to do just about anything. If you have a passion for it, if there, do you want to be in animation? Like is there... Well, I think that's Cool. Well, just keep doing that and, and 
no matter what your background is, uh, I think there's room for everybody uh, to have a chance. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of, it's, it's become more and more inclusive, and I'd, I'd say the industry. I used to be just a bunch of crappy white guys <laughs> in suits. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, it's become much, you know, uh, more and more all the time. Uh, and, you know, as like artists, uh, everyone's a little unique and a little quirky, so like, it's not, uh, it's not unusual for someone to be on spectrum at some level. That's not uh, that uncommon. I think it's I, a lot I of think people. We, yeah, we can probably point to some people. Oh yeah, yeah by definitely. Short, within the spectrum. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. We are down to our last five minutes. We're going to finish up the questions that we have. Good. Hello. 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 <laughs> I have a voice acting question, but it's actually for Darren. Uh, who I think actually on the panel may be the best uh, suited to answer it. Because another misconception that people may have about the uh, casting universe of the animation industry is that the casting director makes the final call, but normally the casting director will usually pare down the hundreds to potentially thousands of auditions and present the creators and producers with a final list of three to seven or so voices for their main characters. So is that a fair description of how it went with Star? And if that's the case, how yeah, do that's, uh, go that's for? true. I got to pick every single voice that's come on the show. Every single voice that was something I had full control over. And I had a great casting director, uh, Rachel Garber at Disney, and she, you know, like it was like like she'll bring people in. So like for Star, that was incredibly hard because we we probably tried out a hundred people. And actually, for an important character like the main character, like Star. We, I, would, I was at the tryouts. We did full tryouts, probably had 100 people come in. I still wasn't happy, and then Rachel had the idea of Eden Cher, and she came in and just knocked out of the park, and it was amazing. But of course, as the show went on, and you get busier and busier, then uh, we did less and less tryouts, and a lot of the time, Rachel would just come in, and we would talk about, oh, you know, we need to have this character, and she's a villain, and I'm thinking kind of like this, and she'd be like, oh, okay. And then she'll go away, and she'll maybe come back with just like, eh, yeah, like six voice samples, or something, and then usually I would just pick one. So you know, it's pretty straightforward. And when you and when you are making those uh, decisions, when you when you have those six, what are you usually listening for? Just something that connects? Or... Yeah, yeah. I think just something that it's like, oh, that feels like the character, you know. Um, and that's really it's a super fun part of the process. Um, yeah. Cool, awesome. Thank you. Hi, guys. Feels good. Hello. Right there. Um, so I wanted to know, as someone who's been actually very deeply inspired by Star. What does it mean to you guys to meet people who have their art inspired by you and your work and your stories? What does that mean to you? Well, uh, I mean, it's been, that's been, yeah, probably the most rewarding and amazing thing is just seeing all these people do all these incredible, like all these side stories for Star and all these side characters and all this stuff. And I'm so excited that it's like, yeah, inspiring people's imagination. I mean, I just did the same thing. I was obsessed with Sailor Moon as a kid, and I had my own Sailor Skin, and I did my own universes, and all that stuff. So I, I feel like it's kind of just like passing the, you know, the, the torch, you know? Like, it's, it's, it's really fun and amazing, and I hope that, that uh, you know, for the people that are inspired and doing their own star stories and artwork, that then maybe that'll transition to, to doing their own characters and artwork. Hi, I'm just wondering, has there ever been an idea you had for one of your shows and the executives were, no, yeah, no, we're not doing that? <laughs> That's a great question. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these guys you basically described like, every day for these guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah I, I man, it's like every, every freaking brain fart you have is there's every 20 weird ideas you get out there, one catches maybe, I don't know, maybe less. It's, a little bit part of the creative process, but yeah. the other part is like, especially when you're trying to do comedy, you're trying to push it, and at some point they say you, you can't have the characters vomit in, in each of these <laughs> I'm sorry. Wait, we can't. Um, did you guys know too that we have an SMP department? Because yes. there is a department at all these studios that looks at all your everything you're making and sends you notes. And, they're, and what's crazy is that there's no standards to the standards department. They're all reactionary. So it'll be a little bit like, oh, you had a fire in your episode. Well, there was just a bad fire on the news. Ooh. So we don't want any fire I, in I your episode. Be, but you're like, this is going to air in nine months. I, I got a great story about yeah. that. So my first show I ever worked on was a kid show called Todd World. And at the end, Todd always had a sign off. He's like, friends are like peanut butter. They always stick together. They cut that line because some kids are allergic to peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no standard. And there's no standard. It's crazy. And then the, 
will also be a thing. Like one of the big things on Star that I've had to go to a lot is I'll be like, but, 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 you let them do it on Gravity Falls. They'll be like, yeah, but that was last year. <laughs> like, oh. All right, thank you. Um, I want to ask, have there ever been moments where you ha like, where you have been upset by your fans? Oh, I had that happen this week. Well, but they weren't my fans. <laughs> fandom in general. Like, the fans, like, like, what they do or how they act or something that they've written where, where they just been like, well, she shouldn't have done this or like, what that, um, the girl um, from Star Wars The Forces of Evil who, I think, she almost killed herself? Because the fans, the fans attacked her were a fan that she did. Yeah, that was Steven Universe. Oh, like, that was Steven Universe. Yeah, I remember hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the clear. Everything like Steven Universe. For Steven Universe, will be like, for the community who's really, really toxic, like, do you guys do anything to do, like, prevent that, or? I know for Rick and Morty, we actually, on Reddit specifically, we have people trying to, you know, clamp down on, like, specifically toxic behavior, because we have that whole, like, hey, the, the show sucks out because there's women writers, and now all the episodes are crap. I'm like, and we all, like, on the crew, we're like, Fuck you, asshole. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we can do that because we're on a show. Like, I don't care about shit. But, like, yeah, and the other thing is, like, when we do, like, on Titans or Star or either, like, younger shows, like, some of them we have to say, like, all right, they're children, they're young people, they don't really, like, children are vicious. They don't know anything yet, and they have to be socialized. Yeah. It's a little bit we can do outside of, like, trying to like, create a more positive message. You know, kind of, like, just ourselves with giving them any ammo. I think we're down to our last question. Hi. Hello. Hi. So I want to say that um, I thank all of you guys for creating the shows that you do because I was never really a cartoon person as a kid. Like even as a kid, like I was, I watched Daria. That was my. Daria's the best. Good show. Yeah, good show. that was my favorite cartoon as a kid. So as I as I got older though, like I noticed uh, like some of the cartoons like Star vs. you know the Forces and Steven Universe and a few others, like Teen Titans especially, were a little more like, uh, what do you call it, uh, up to date. Well, like, I mean, they're, they're a little more like, what's going on around, like what's happening, and I'm getting back into watching cartoons again. Like I've been watch, binge watched seasons of stuff now. So I wanna say thanks for that. Thank you. And then my other question was, um, uh, very far. Uh, Think about breakfast, it'll come back. <laughs> so I was telling people it works. Well, while you're thinking, can I just say one thing real quick? Because I know we've been talking about a whole bunch of things at this panel today, and I just want to say, as somebody working on a cartoon, we do a lot of complaining. I think there's a lot of like kind of crappy things that we have to deal with with making cartoons, but also it's kind of the coolest thing in the world. Like I feel like so I have to remind myself sometimes that it's it's like I love cartoons and it's so amazing to be able to to make them and live in these worlds and and draw for a living. And there's there's it's yeah, really cool. It's really special. Else. Yeah, yeah I, I can't imagine honestly doing anything else. So, can yeah. you battle? No. <laughs> <laughs> I what like advice, reading. I do have a question. Uh, what advice do you guys do have for people who want to do voice acting? Like, what would uh, make sure that every performance that you have is like uh, just in the. It starts with the acting first, and the voice comes naturally afterwards. It's I learned the hard way because I didn't go to school for like theater, yeah, or dramatic music. arts, yeah, 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 sure. and and. and one of the first notes that I got was, yeah, he's a nice guy and he can do multiple voices, but he's a terrible actor. <laughs> and that was crushing, but also was the truth, because I, that, I, again, I was doing faxes and photocopies. And being a kick-ass artist. <laughs> yeah, sort of. But now, uh, you know, like, uh, it's, it's what I do, like, seven, five, five days a week. It's, it's crazy. Okay, do, yeah. you, do you recommend, like, practicing, doing, like, getting audio gear and things like that? Because for myself, yeah. like, I'm interested. Yeah. I've always had an interest And there's in tons of, like, local classes. Just don't pay, like, an arm and a leg. It, I try to do, like, classes, like, the, the least amount of money. If anything, just pay the engineer and the studio. I don't hardly ever collect on the classes that I teach. Because I just want people to feel like, okay, is this for you or isn't it for you? You know? Thank you guys very much. Never yeah. change. Can we be hand for our panelists? <laughs> Thank you guys so much for coming to New York Fall Con 2018. I'm Lauren Stone, editor in chief. You guys enjoy the rest of the show. Yeah. If you won the giveaway, come see me. It's red. Nerd bot. Thank you.